Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I am Ramon Mejia here, bringing here you the latest Lit RPG news reviews and of course author interviews. Uh, this week on the podcast, the December episode 88 of the show, like we're already get, getting pretty close to the 90s and the 100s and on from there. Um, this week I have nine new Lit RPG reviews for you folks at home. Uh, before we get to that, I want to give a quick uh, shout out to James Tavares, who is generous enough to donate uh, $10 via PayPal to the podcast to help support the show. So thank you, James, for being so generous uh, and for everyone else who helps keep the podcast going every single month. So thank you all. Uh, in the new releases and reviews, we're going to be reviewing again nine new little BGs, uh, including Warrior Academy, A Hero's Journey, Episode 1. Uh, then on to Know Thy Enemy. Uh, after that, it'll be Veritas Online, God Mode Off, the Little Bitty Sci-Fi Book 1. Uh, then on to Powerless, the Reborn Saga. After that, it'll be Avatar Online Launch. Then, after that, it's going to be Threadbare Volume 1, Stuff and Nonsense. And after that, it'll be Galactic Fist of Legend Volume 3. And after that, it'll be Depths of Camelon, a Little Bitty Adventure in Camelon Realms Book 2 in that series. Uh, and then last but not least, it's going to be Odyssey, the Stroke Tower Book Number two uh so there we go so those are the nine new little we're reviewing this week but, but before we begin we of course start off with uh lit rpg news and we begin our little bit news section with two smaller stories we actually have uh, jeffrey rock and Logue, author of the slime dungeon chronicles made his own book trailer uh for the fourth novel in his series uh, i think it's pretty neat myself um the only like thing that kind of bothered me when i was watching it was that it was recorded in portrait mode and not landscape mode so it looks a little it's like very narrow bars black bars on the side and i'm like okay that's um that's a choice uh like next time just drop the camera sideways and you get a much better like wider angle view um it'll feel much screens and stuff but that's me uh we're playing it for the uh, folks at home who are listening watching hopefully uh we don't get like tagged for like audio infringement or whatever it is and we're playing it so um cross our fingers uh but it's a cute it's a very it's a nice cute video that promotes the fourth book in his series uh but i know that he again he made it himself video i believe uh source the audio the whole shebang so there you go mm-hmm there it is okay uh so that is one uh nice um audio book or sorry not a book uh but book trailer i wish of another one from lit world um the folks over at lit world or the folks who, who translate the the feral series from russian into english they also came out with a uh a new book trailer uh for their feral series this one is a um, motion comic book trailer uh, and to me, honestly, it uh, it kind of feels like a the new world. I'll mute that for a second. It feels like a trailer for an MMO, um, like the things that they say and describe. Like that feels like it's for like an MMO game or like a mobile game that they're trying to advertise. Um, which maybe with the vibe they're going for, considering Feral's uh, was supposed to be an MMO. Um, but here it is. What it is. It will be. The adventure is just beginning. Mystery. Exciting quests. Real friends. Dangerous enemies. Millions of players. Become a legend. Pharaoh. Now on Amazon. So there you go. That is their trailer. Uh, and that's kind of it for Little Pigeon. There's two new book trailers. Um, one for a series for the last book, or for fourth book, I should say. That's supposed to be coming out. Um, the book trailer kind of hints that it may be the last battle. I don't know if that means it's the last book in the series or not. But hopefully see that book pretty soon. It was supposed to come out the beginning of December. It is not going to be the beginning of January. So hope to see it soon. And Gorn's Feral is already out. Um, all written, and it's just being translated in English one book at a time. Okay, um, some of the stories that are out now that I haven't had a chance to read. 
uh, including Galen Wolf's Camelot Defiant, which is the fourth book in that series. We also have uh, a new entry into the Liberty World, uh, Dodge Tank by Rick Scott. That is out now. We also have the third and final book in the uh, Accidental series. It's called The Accidental Mage. Um, that is out. And Change, book three of The Stork Tower by Tony Corden is also out. And I have to apologize to the author, Tony Corden. Um, I apparently missed or my brain didn't register the fact that his his books came out i reviewed book one a while ago uh and in the meantime book two and book three have come out uh and for some reason my brain just didn't recognize that they were new uh it might be the fact that the covers look almost identical to each other that might have been the thing but either way i apologize to the author uh book three is out currently and we're reviewing book two today on the show um book three will review next week um in that particular episode so thanks and again i apologize to tony Okay, uh, also out this week is uh, book five in the World of Games series, The Eternal, called Hellbringer. Um, I am not going to be reviewing this book in particular, mostly because um, I'm sort of losing interest in the series. I missed reading the last book when it came out. I got, got plotted with other things. And ever since, I'm just like, uh, eh, I'm not particularly... It's not like the uh, series that captures me every single time, unfortunately. Um, it is not a bad series, by any means, and I... I enjoy the books when I read them, but it's not the kind of series that I'm just so super anxious to read. Uh, so again, I, I, my brain is not one that can skip a novel in a series and continue on with it. Uh, so I will first have to go back and read the other books in the series before I can catch up. So, but for now, I'm just letting you know that it is, it is out. Okay, um, so new literary audio books. We have Alpha Company, Alpha World Book 3 is already out. Uh, produced by Podium Publishing, written by Dan O'Shinahofen, friend of the podcast, um, and performed by Peter Brook. Uh, Burkut. Burkut. Uh Also out is The Runesmith, uh, written by Galen and Wolf, performed by Damien Almas. Uh, it is a, I, I believe it's a short story or a shorter story. Um, so there might be some length to it. Um, I don't know. Um, we also have Travail Online, Soul Keeper, finally come out as a as a audiobook. It is read by Andrea um, Parsnew. So I know she has a great voice, uh, written by Myman Simmons. Uh, of course, we have um, links in the show notes to all the ebook reviews for each one of those titles. If you want to go see if the story's uh, good or not, uh, I can't tell you what the audiobooks seem like. Haven't listened to them yet, uh, but you know, also n- n- people's appreciation of narrators vary by person. So I'm always headed to say, oh, I like this or I don't, because my taste, as far as like narrators go, may not match your own. Okay, uh, in upcoming Little G, these are just the stories that are coming out in the next few weeks or months. Um, I'm just letting you know about them. You can skip ahead if you wish to. Uh, I am dropping the Land Book 7 from the upcoming Little list and also the Slam Dungeon Chronicles Book 4, um, mostly because I don't know when they're coming out. Like The author told us, both authors told me uh, specific dates. They missed those publication dates, um, and they kept moving them back. Um, and at this point, I'm like, okay, I don't, they're just going to drop when they drop. I hope they come out as soon as possible. I'm looking forward to reading both of the books, but I actually don't have any idea when they're coming out anymore, so... Um, they're going to be dropping the list for now. Okay, uh, on January the 5th, though, 2018, is going to be Press Start, written by Kayla Lavon. On the 7th of January, it'll be Jeff Sproul's Sigil Online Hellions, which is the second book in the series, I believe. It is going to be uh, January the 8th as well. It's going to be Soul Reckoning, a little bit of adventure in Bill Walker's book two series. We're also going to get uh, Michael At- um The Dark Herbalist, book three, The Trap for the Potentate, on January the 17th. Then on the January the 24th, it'll be The Reapers, which is the numero book three. And then moving into February of 2018, it's going to be The Clan Wars, Way the Shaman book seven. The author hasn't given a specific date, but he has said publicly uh, on his Facebook page that he, that's what he's been told. It's coming out in February. So there you go. Uh, also out in March 12th of 2018 is going to be Avatars Rising Silos um, one. I'm assuming that means book one in the series, potentially, uh, by a couple authors I, I don't know. So hopefully we'll see something interesting from them. Um, on March the 16th, however, we're going to get uh, Don Chapman's. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to be the fourth book in the Patera Online series, but I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be an entirely different character in an entirely different world. Um, so much drama connection it's going to be, but it's called Achilles Reign. And uh, Don has said that this is very RPG-ish. So I look forward to giving a read when, it, when it's available. Uh, and that's it for upcoming stuff. On to new releases and reviews. And uh, first off in new releases and reviews, uh, we're going to begin with Warrior Academy, A Hero's Journey, Episode 1 in the Warrior Academy series, written by G.L. 
Rathwig. So there you go. Um, and honestly, I was surprised to see the name of this. Uh, the author writes another little bitty series, which is uh, generally more, um, it's a little funnier, adultish. Um, so, uh, but this is, he wants to brand himself a little bit with this series. So I, I get that. So he's using a slightly different pen name. Um, this one is uh, 326 pages, $2.99. Uh, note that it is not available in Kindle Unlimited currently, um, at least now. Uh, I'll read you the author's description. Now, after the world is destroyed, Earth's last survivors start anew. Now, in a world forever changed, a place, is, a place where magic is real and monsters have come to life. A place where magic and science blend with pop culture to become war, welcome to Warrior Academy, rather. Hero begins his journey and starts his first year at WA. Join him for adventure, romance, and revenge. If you like video games, music, anime, or just pop culture in general, you will love Warrior Academy. It's Harry Potter meets Naruto with a little Dragon Ball Z and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons, rather, to run in for fun. Oh, and don't forget a smattering of high school musical. Um, this is the first episode in a Zit to be Determined long series. Well, that, you know, that part. Um, there's also a attached YouTube and Spotify playlist meant to be listened with each episode. Uh, and if you remember the author who does that with his series, it's the same. It is the same guy. Um, my opinion, basically, um, very well priced. This is a much thicker novel. Usually, the author's novels are a hundred ish pages. Uh, you write short stories, and so this one's a bit thicker. Um, this is the same author who writes the hilarious, to me anyways, uh, Earth Online series, uh, spelled E-R-Y-T-H. Um, and this is a little more, I don't know, I guess mature? Maybe that's the word? Um, it's, a, it's a slice of life, high school, uh, lit RPG series. The author describes it as, again, Harry Potter meets Naruto with a little Dragon Ball Z and Dungeons and Dragons thrown in for fun. And as long as that sounds, um, it's rather accurate. Like there's a lot of pulls from different um, genres and concepts and they're all kind of mushed together and somehow it works, at least for me. Um, it might be a little weird to some people. Um, some people might not enjoy it, but like I said, it's, it's if you've enjoyed Earth Online, um, this is a fun series too. It just doesn't have um, some of the more objectionable parts in that series uh, in this one. This one's very relatively clean um, uh, humor and there's definitely um, no use of substances that people don't enjoy in this one. So uh, it's like I said, it's more, it's more mainstream. Definitely. Um, again, the novel combines a um, magical ninja Academy story with tournaments now fighting and RPG descriptions of powers. I guess it's a fun read with, with a lot of pop culture references. Again, the only downside for me was the lack of definite RPG progression for a lot of the novel. Um, there's a lot of setup in the story. Um, it, uh, there's a definitely RPG descriptions of various powers, um, how the school works, who's who. And there's definitely, there's a foundation laid for RPG progression, whether it's going to be uh, in crafting or in specific um, points they get that they can increase skills with when they win duels or whatever. Um, that all is all set up in the story currently. It is not, however, uh, there's not a ton of development of the characters in that respect yet. Um, and I would have hoped to see more, but it is what it is. Uh, I still enjoyed it. It's still a little bit for me. Um, and again, it's a good read for me. It's very funny. Um, and again, it's more mainstream than his other series. For me, I enjoyed it. Um, not everybody is going to, though. I'll, I'll be upfront about that. This is a very specific kind of humor. And again, if you liked Earth Online, you'll probably like this as well. Um, it gets a score of 7 out of 10 for me. Again, that's Warriors Academy, A Hero's Journey, Episode 1, uh, with a score of 7 out of 10. Okay, next one. Know Thy Enemy, One World, Three Worlds, by Don Chapman and Matt Ferraz. So there you go. Um, this one is 333 pages. $4.99 it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, I believe it's published by a third party company. Uh, I'll read you the author's description. Trapped in a broken body, Pierce earns the right to enter the hottest new game. Following his warrior's instincts, he's determined to annihilate the enemy, whoever it may be. With the hopes of winning the ultimate prize, respect of his peers, and protection from his brothers, sorry, protection for his brothers, Drake joins the guild in the fight of his life, not realizing what's truly at stake. To save New Arat, they must commit to their quest. Yet the planet's residents aren't all what they seem, and enemies must become friends and fight together. Okay, so this is a this is a very interesting story in a lot of ways. Um, it's a multi-narrative story told mostly through the eyes of two particular characters. Um, Drake is a lizard man alien who hopes to join a good guild and play the game to earn enough uh, money to support his twin brother and prevent him from getting drafted into this big galactic war thing. Excuse me, Purse is a human from Earth. He's a professional gamer, and he was training to become a soldier. Now he's humanity's last hope to win the right to colonize an alien world before Earth dies. 
Um, each narrative is independent, and the story switches between the two every two to three percent of the story. Um, the stories cross about um, sorry, the narrative I should say cross about the sixty-six percent mark. So you're well into the story by the time these these storylines meet. Um, but even after that, the the chapters still switch back and forth between characters. So it is what it is. Uh, if you don't like that kind of structure, don't read this. Um, but if you're cool with that, shouldn't bother you. Um, there are a lot of things that I liked and some things that I didn't. Uh, I'll start with things that I did enjoy. Uh, the novel has a really strong start. Um, there's really good character development. The characters' backstories are genuinely interesting. I actually really did enjoy learning about Pierce's backstory as a human, how he became in a situation, the kind of the world building there. Um, Drake's storyline is, it's, it's okay. It's not bad. Uh, it's simply less interesting to me than, than Pierce's. Um, and the story does emphasize, it really does build up why the game is important for each character, which is important. Um, the early parts of Drake's storyline, again, are interesting. In a storyline, we, we first uh, we get our first glimpse into the game. Basically, again, these are almost two different stories, you know, Drake's and Pierce's. Uh, and so I'm coming on Drake's first. Um, Drake is the first one to go into the game to show us what it's about and give us little hints about what may be coming up in the future. There were even some interesting sci-fi subplots there, but you do get a nice little tease about um, the game, game mechanics, and how the world is set up within the system, um, and what, what the game kind of is, um, to at least this particular culture, um, relatively early in the story. However, he drops out of that uh, particular game world, and he doesn't go back again until like the 36% mark. So there's a good 30% chunk there where it's it's all like real life, world storyline for Drake, at least. Um, the other character, Pierce, um, he actually, the beginning portion of his storyline um, is mostly all real world stuff. Like it's a bunch of character development, backstory things. And he doesn't actually start in the game until the 24% market story. So, um, it is, I mean, it is kind of what it is. Um, however, once both characters get into the game, they stay there for the majority of the story. Um, so that, that's a plus for me. Um, the action is relatively well written. Um, and the last 20% of the novel is basically a huge series of battles. So if you're looking for action, um, this does, does have quite a bit of it. Um, now things in the novel that I think could be improved. Um, I describe the story as a sci-fi little bit G. Um, heavy emphasis on the sci-fi. Um, yes, the story is little bit G. There's no question for me, at least. Um, again, two qualifiers for me, at least. Um, the majority of the story is set in an obvious city game world with RPG mechanics and to the characters progress according to those RPG mechanics. Uh, really simple, like minimum guidelines to be a little bit G. Um, and again, once the characters get into this game, there are regular no game notification, there are level ups, there is XP given for, for completed quests. Um, so all that is there. It's literally G. Okay. Um, yet there are some, there are some issues I have mostly doing with the game mechanics in the story. Um, the story surrounding those notifications and those game mechanics kind of ignore them a lot, or at least like they minimize their importance to the story. Uh, often recognizing like sometimes these, these quest notifications or these, these pop-ups of whatever we're saying, um, kind of just within the story. So there's a notification and below it, but like he read and that's kind of it. Uh, and then, and, and so in terms of like interaction with the game system, this story is a more minimalistic, um, than a lot of other literature in other literature stories. Uh, for example, characters interact with the game system a ton. They study it to figure out ways to progress. Um, they they intentionally put um, time and effort into um, skill trees. Uh, some authors will have like these huge, long skill trees that maybe they're never going to use. But at least it's like information up for the reader about what is possible within this story. Um, I'll, and, and of course, it's really common to have, have characters kind of think about how they're going to be building their character in terms of like skills, abilities, magical choices, whatever. And that really doesn't exist here. Um, the RPG progression is mostly automatic, um, automatic leveling. And a lot of times in the story, that leveling doesn't really impact the story directly. Like they'll, like at some point in the story, characters will have like these huge jumps in like stat points, like constitution going from like 15 to 80. And it doesn't really change how the story plays out. You know, they're not like suddenly Superman, even though they've made like an 80%, you know, eight, eight times jump in their, in their stats or whatever. Um, other places it's a little and part part of the issues i have is that there's there's almost a disconnect between some of the story parts because they're written by two different authors who are writing into different times even though they collaborated um inevitably when you have two different minds creating these systems you're going to have some some disconnect one in particular point is um 
that there's a few inconsistencies in the game mechanics. Um, early on in the Pierce short line, you, uh, he notes that you can either pay for new skills with money or just practice endlessly to get them. Game mechanic, right? Okay, whatever. Um, yet in the Drake story, uh, the character was given a card that gives him a new skill, and later on he gets a skill through touching another character. Um, and and again, it's 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 just a small inconsistency that shows oh, two different people maybe you know had two different ideas and they they weren't in sync one hundred percent. There are also like inconsistency issues with the respawn system. Um, for one, we don't know about it as a reader until like way into the story, uh, and. And suddenly becomes dying in the game, dying in real life. I'm like, oh, that's that's a that's a really late um, story twist to like add to the game mechanic system when we've been reading about it for like I don't know, 130 pages or whatever. Um, and again, small things, uh, but again, they do kind of show like a, a lack of attention to detail for as far as the the game mechanics though. And that's just the way the story is written. It is like I said, emphasis heavy emphasis on the sci-fi instead of the little RPG. Um, the Drax storyline. Um, as another issue, um, it's sort of the Drake. I keep saying Drake for some reason, maybe because it's a lizard person. Um, it, it's a little boring um, from like the 30% mark to the 66% mark. So if we're good 30% of the story, I'm not really invested in that character. Um, and it kind of feels like filler with like only one real notable story revelation as far as I'm concerned. Um, another issue is that as the story progresses past the 75% mark of the story, there's like a really interesting sci-fi twist. It is super interesting, but it kind of makes the game stuff irrelevant and i'm like i'm like oh man uh and, and you kind of see it coming if you're like looking for the clues uh and this revelation is just like it explains why the game stuff never got particularly in depth um because like the writer obviously knew this was heading this is what the real thing with the world was um but it almost also shifts the story almost entirely into sci-fi and away from little rpg and that's just again this is these are story choices that were made in the story and it's neither good nor bad it just is uh but for me as somebody who's really does dig the game stuff, the RPG mechanics in like these literary stories. It's a kind of a slight disappointment. Um, also, there's a seriously dangly cliffhanger to the story. Like you're like, he might as well be hanging off of a cliff. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's, 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 yeah. Um, overall, this is a good sci-fi read. It just has weak RPG mechanics. So they're there. It's little RPG. No question about that. It's just that it lacks depth and that's just a story choice. Um, that's just the way it is written. Um, if you're looking for, again, for a, great little bit of story that makes you feel like you're in a sci-fi game. This isn't it. It's more just general sci-fi with RPG mechanics in there. And that's fine. The sci-fi stuff again is well-written. The story is, is interesting in that respect. Um, it's just that it basically uses an RPG VR game to tell a story. And, you know, um, to me, it just stops it from being particularly good. Uh, so for me, it gets a score six out of 10. And again, that's not a bad score. It's not boring. It's not a five. It's not actually bad or anything, which is a four and below at six is basically, this is almost good except for these things. Uh, and for some people, those same things that make it less good for me will not, will be interesting for other people. And that's perfectly fine. Um, so for again, know thy enemy, it gets a score of six out of 10 and that's it is, is what it is. Okay. On to our next review. Um, Veritas online God mode off little BG sci-fi book one from Brian cross. Okay. This is uh, 44 pages. It is a short story folks. It is 99 cents. It is also available on Kindle limited. Um, I'll read you the author's description in this intense heart pounding lit RPG sci-fi series. You meet a young man named Russet who works for a company called virtue real, um, which is, which is in the, you know, it's just responsible for creating and maintaining different virtual reality systems. Their newest VR system is called Virtual Entertainment Remote uh, Induction and Training System, also known as Veritas. Russet is the civilian contractor in charge of their biggest project yet, which is within with the United States Department of Defense. The military basically has has us building virtual environments for their soldiers to train. The company's technology is cutting edge. We can put any healthy adult in one of the immersion pods and send them into these digital worlds that to them are indistinguishable from reality. The edge that Veritas has over VR systems is that it actually hooks up to the user's brain and puts them into a kind of RPG system. Their attributes are measured by the system and hundreds of variables fed into the simulation. While the users feel like they're engaged in real-time combat, their results are all simulated too, just like RPG games. Okay, and that's kind of it. Um, eventually, there are real-time problems that the main character has to fix, and that's kind of the author's description. Um, and again, this is just a short story. Um, 
Again, 44 pages, 99 cents. It's a little expensive for the page count, but that's as low as Amazon lets you go without making it free. Uh, so 99 cents is kind of it. Um, but it's also on Kindle Unlimited, so if you want to take a chance on it and you have that particular in, in that program, um, I'd say give it a read. It's well, is I liked it. Um, the beating does seem to have a big push to collect email addresses for like a mailing list, um, which a lot of authors do. It's just that at the beginning, it's not the best impression to me. It's like something you generally put at the back of the novel. If they like it, if they get to the end, okay, then you know, if you want to learn about more myself, go send it for my mailing list. Um, just a personal opinion. Also, uh, the story really does take a relatively long time to get to the RPG part of this story. Uh, there's lots of talk early in the short story about RPG mechanics existing in the game, but you don't actually see them until about the 65% mark of the story. Um, however, once they show up, it does become a very entertaining read with characters training, improving stats and leveling. Um, everything before that is just um, set up for the story. Uh, sometimes the justification for some of the things happening tech-wise are a little implausible, but um, it is what it is. It's kind of just a justification to get everybody stuck in the game and set up the stakes of the story. Uh, so there it is. Two things that did bother me though. One, um, early parts of the story have combat locks, but they don't mean anything. Uh, and that always bugs me because the reader isn't given context for the and, and people who have played video games before can kind of maybe piece things together. Um, but as far as most readers are going to be like, these are just numbers and names. Um, you haven't defined what any of this stuff means. So I don't know if it, it's a tough battle or an easy battle, or if these guys are in really trouble, uh, because none of those, none of the context has been set up yet for as far as the game mechanics system yet. Uh, two, um, there's a feature in this novel called automatic time progression. And we've seen that before in other novels. It's just that in this one, it's, it's a little different in that, um, the time compression is automatically changed depending upon the people in the game. So for example, if you have five people, um, your time correction might be just be two times normal time, right? Great. But if you drop down to three people, um, like there were three really smart people for some reason, then time compression can be 16 times as much as real time automatically with no real explanation as to why there's a shift. Uh, and that to me just didn't really make sense. Why would it matter if more or less people are playing unless like something's happening where like the game's using their brains, but that's not um, defined in this particular story. So I'm like, uh, okay, it's a thing to kind of overlook if you can. Um, overall, it's a good read. Once an RPG mechanics show up, um, the cliffhanger ending is going to bother some people, but the author assures us that he's going to write something and publish it relatively quickly so that, you know, there's that gap between those two. Uh, again, so relatively decent action scenes. Um, I would have liked to have seen more world development and character development, but again, it's a short story and I plan to read the next episode when it comes out. So um, I enjoyed it. I think it's a score of seven out of 10 for me. Again, that's Veritas Online, God Mode Off um, with the score of seven out of 10. So there you go. Thank you. Okay, on to number four. Uh, the fourth book uh, for this week's review and I, you know, the stats bother me. I gotta adjust it. I think that's too much. Okay, so there you go. Um, it is Powerless, the Reborn Saga, written by Anthony W.F. Chow. Um, there we go. Uh, this is 177 pages, $2.99 that available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, the author says that this is a this entire novel is a result of the NaNoWriMo writing project uh, that he accomplished. Um, so this is it. Uh, I will read you the author's description. What happens when we die? The answer to this question becomes personal for a teenage boy who named himself Schmedrick when he's reborn into the world called the Sanctum. As a reborn, he is thrust into an unforgiving society splintered between gifted, those who are those blessed with aether field powers, and the powerless, who are treated as outcasts and forced to live in the dangerous recovered land. When Schmedrick discovers a secret uh, in the Resdi city, and the system seeks his capture and exclamation, the teenager is forced to leave and make his way to the wasteland known as the Shar. There he makes another discovery, which will change his life as a reborn forever. Um, during his sleep, Shundrum is played by dreams and memories of his past life, who he was before, and and reborn. So there you go. Um, this is this is a story. It is. Uh, the beginning of the story drops the main character, Smendrick, and a group of others into an RPG world as reborn. They're supposed to serve the game system. The next 33% of the story is kind of this tedious, forced noob training in, like, in, in a place literally called the Noob School, where they learn how to access the game stuff and train in basic combat. Um, and yes, the main character gets XP and levels, but the thing he lacks is like an agency to make decisions. And basically, this first section almost feels like a 
prison for these characters. Like everything they do is regimented. It's 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 forced. It's it, um, the characters really don't have a decision as to what they're doing within the system. Um, and to me, that that lack of agency is it's kind of a detriment. It made this entire first third of its story basically really boring to me. And a lot of the rest of the story is too, because that same kind of theme occurs throughout the entire novel. Um, it, it really does feel like the main character is led by his nose through the entire story, and he never really makes a single decision as to what he's doing in this world. Um, there again, there it's literally RPGs. It, there's no question about that. There's levels. Uh, the main character gets quests, things like that. It's all it's a very RPG world. Um, but what never really develops is like a character for the the main character. I should say there's no depth to him. There's no emotional range. Um, he's a very apathetic character, and and there are reasons for it, I suppose, within the novel. Like it's later revealed, um, you know, what his backstory is, like with his uh, with the dream memories thing that the author talked about in the novel description. But it doesn't really make up for how he acts in this world. The most interesting parts of his emotional um, emotionality so is are those flashbacks, but they don't uh, they don't actually affect his actual actions or thinking processes in the novel when he's in this world. And that was kind of sad. Um, there are. Uh, some comment scenes, they're okay, they're decent, but they don't really make up for the lack of, uh, for the rest of the story, I should say. Um, again, the main character goes on a variety of quests, gains specialized skills, abilities, but again, it really doesn't have any character development that makes me care about him. Um, and that's kind of the detriment of this novel. It never really got beyond um, boring. I mean, it's 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 basically very mediocre for me. Um, the RPG mechanics are aren't the best. They're not the worst though. Uh, the story again, not the best, not the worst. And so it kind of goes, you know, along the same way with the story. Uh, the story is very net for me. Uh, it gets a score of five out of 10 for powerless, the reborn saga, uh, for that's it. Sorry. Uh, it's just wasn't particularly entertaining for me. So there you go. Okay. Uh, next story. We have avatar online launch. Um, so there you go. Uh, written by WD Nix. Okay, this one is 69 pages, another short story, 99 cents, also available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, the author's description is super short. Uh, Forced to work together while trapped in a game, alliances are forged and love is born from the ashes of old resentments. Redemption is possible for one, but another is doomed to follow a dark path. This is a novella of almost 22,000 words and book one in the Avatar Lawn series. So um, this is the first literary short story written by W.D. Nix, um, and it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, I kind of, look, as as, an, as somebody who, the first story he ever wrote in his life was like a year ago, and he published it, um, I know your first story is always going to be kind of rough, uh, and that's life. Uh, I, I So I, I maybe my... Um, maybe I'm a little empathetic towards the author, uh, but this isn't a bad story. There are definitely some flaws. Uh, I won't, I won't hide those from you or anything. Um, it is Liberty G, uh, uh, it is, however, not the most crunchy. There's not a ton of numbers. There's not a lot of, um, depth to these game mechanics, but it has some highlights to it. Um, again, the game mechanic side, relatively light. Um, the story sent in a beta version of an MMORPG, um, and there's exactly like one leveling of any character in this story. Again, it's a short story, so it's not like it's a lot of room to, to work with. Um, additionally, though, there are there's a look at like the skills of one particular character and their quest notifications. And that's kind of it as far as the game mechanics. So a lot of the story is written as um, the descriptions of like action scenes uh, and interactions with this game world. They're written almost as fantasy. Uh, and which is fine. Uh, it's just I would have personally loved to have seen more game stuff. And that, I mean, that's just a story choice. Um, the author freely admits um, that his story focuses on the relationship between the characters. And I absolutely agree. Um, that's probably the, the, the biggest draw for this particular story. Um, the dynamics between the characters is the focus of the story. There's redemption for one brother, a fall from grace for another. There's a long-standing emotional issues for one of the women in the series, a story and her best friend that's first loyal. There's a lot of good emotional depth and preparation in the story. That you could tell the author put a lot of time into into figuring out interesting um, emotional drews for these characters. Um, and and to me, that was probably the best part of this particular story. Um, there are some places, there, well, I should say some, there are a lot of places that I thought the, the story could have focused more on RPG mechanics and action instead of character development. But again, that's a personal choice. That's a personal preference. Um, every author writes a story they want to write. 
Uh, and I don't, you know, begrudge every author that choice. Um, personally, I would have loved to have seen a character creation scene instead of like them just popping up in their characters. Um, I would have loved to have seen like the options available for these particular in this particular game, whether you know whether it's races and classes and skill trees, whatever the case is. Um, it would have been nice to, to kind of get a peek into some of the things that were possible in this world. Um, in one scene in particular. There's a little bit of inconsistency as well. That's not explained in the story, I should say. Um, in one scene again, a ranger character suddenly has the powers of a mage. Like they're she's throwing spells left and right. Um, and this might be a setup for something later on in another book in the series. But it doesn't really make sense in this one because it's not really established that cross class skills are possible here. Instead, the author kind of justifies it saying, Oh, the game must have read my mind and that I played mages sometimes. And that's kind of it. And I'm like, Oh, that would, that would have been a perfect opportunity to like, either like pull out a character sheet and say, Oh, look, I have this spell that I don't know what happened to it. And, you know, or like go into like some AI development stuff. But instead the author just kind of magic wands it away a little bit. Uh, and to me, that's just, there are a lot of missed opportunities as far as like developing the game mechanics stuff as well as you did the character development stuff. Um, there are also some places that I thought were a little overdone. Uh, for example, there's just one too many scenes for me where the character Logan apologizes for who he was. He's kind of a jerk in the past instead of showing who he is now, which is basically a stand-up dude. Um, overall, it's not a bad story. For me, it just falls a little bit short of being like a seven out of 10, um, mostly because of game mechanic issues and like um, just like would have loved to see basically comes into this for me. Again, the author does an amazing, or he does a really good job. You can tell he put a lot of time into developing these characters, personalities, backstories, where they're going, you know, story-wise. Um, and I just wish he would have taken as much time to develop the depth of the game world. Uh, because for me, I, I, I know when I read Liberty, that's also something that I'm looking for. That's why I read Liberty instead of just sci-fi or fantasy is because the game world is almost another character. And then when you think about it that way, it, it should be treated with equal importance of like developing backstory or world building and developing character traits or like game mechanic stuff. Um, and, and I guess it, I'm not speaking off this choice to write what he wrote. It's just that that's something that I look for and something that I personally enjoy when I'm reading Liberty. And because this didn't happen, like, okay, it's just slightly less enjoyable for me. Uh, for me, I totally plan to read the author's future stories and he does, uh, I had a little small conversation with him. He says he does plan to develop the game mechanics in future stories. And I hope that's the case. Uh, and we'll have to see. Uh, but for now, Avatar Online launch gets a score of six out of 10. Again, not bad. It's just not quite at that good point, at least for me. Uh, other people might enjoy it because it doesn't have a bunch of game development stuff. Uh, but that's for me, six out of 10 for Avatar Online launch. So there we go. Okay, on to... Uh, the Red Bear, Volume 1, Stuff and Nonsense. This is written by Andrew Seepel. Um, I honestly love this cover art. It's super adorable. Um, this is 261 pages, $4.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, and that price is a little towards the edge of where I would normally pay for something. I usually look for something about, um, um, what is it, $0.10 cents a page? Um and this one is almost double. Um, but for me, honestly worth it. It was a good story. Um, I'll read you the author's description. Meet Threadbear. He is 12 inches tall, full of fluff, and really, really bad at being a hero. Magically animated and discarded by his maker as a failed experiment, he is saved by a little girl. But she's got problems of her own, and he might not be able to help her. Fortunately for the little golem, he's quick to find allies, learn skills, gain levels, and survive horrible predicaments which is good because this creator has a whole lot of enemies. So, okay. Um, this was just like a surprisingly, surprisingly good story. Um, when you look at that cover, you, you might think children's story, something weird. Um, but it's honestly um, one of my favorite reads of the week. Um, it's like Paddington Bear or the Velveteen Rabbit got a character sheet and they leveled up from their adventures. It's a really cute story in my opinion. But it also has... Um, it, it 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 has some interesting twists and turns. And it's not it's not it's not necessarily a kid's story, um, but you kind of get that kid's story vibe from it, I guess. Um, but there are also some very occasionally dark places that it goes. Um, Threadbear, who's a, a golem teddy bear, has to survive his creator's experiments, the rough attention of a child, and the destructive vengeance of a household cat. Each challenge he overcomes builds Threadbear's stats, levels, and skills. Soon it becomes more than just a clumsy clumsy golem. 
um, eventually threadbare, even a complex companies as human on her adventures as the larger RPG world opens up to her. There's plenty of action and adventure in the story, as well as great RPG game mechanics and rather decent world building. Now, the only thing I'd say that the... Um, that needs work is kind of the transition between characters, especially like very early in the story. There's no um, transitionary statements or indicators um, when the story shifts from one character to another. For example, in one sentence, you might be reading about um, Threadbare's actions and his thoughts and his whatever's going through his little um, stuffing filled brain. Uh, but in the next sentence, you're, you're looking at an entirely different viewpoint, someone else in a different place um, and their thoughts or like the cats. And there's no like division sometimes between those particular scenes. Uh, so small thing it doesn't stop me from enjoying the story in any way, shape or form, but it is something that, that stuck out to me re repeatedly. Um, also in the last 6% of the novel it is almost entirely character sheets and glossaries of abilities and skills. Um, so you can definitely get some in-depth stuff as far as like abilities and stuff there if you want to go check that out. Uh, but for me, it's really, it's a quite an enjoyable story. Uh, it's good to me. It gets a score of seven out of 10. Uh, again, that's Threadbare, volume one, stuff and nonsense um, with a score of seven out of 10. Okay, uh, on to Galactic Fist of Legend, volume three, written by Scotty Hooch. Okay, it is uh, 302 pages. It is $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Limited. I read you the author's description. The legendary fisting journeys of Scott and his team continue in this next exciting installment of Galactic Fist of Legend. During their first team building mission, Scott's grab bag group of modern pop culture icons stumbles across a dire situation involving a familiar tunic clad hero. Can Scott lead his team to pull off the most dangerous missions he's ever faced? Or will they fail and doom entire worlds to ruin? Stay tuned and find out. Uh, morning, this story depicts graphic violence, score, occasional gratuitous nudity, the power of friendship, and strangely adult interactions with sentient plants. You're welcome. So that's all the author's description. Uh, Scotty Future is always a really fun writer. He's also not afraid of um, going the sexy route occasionally. Uh, there are no... Like graphic sex scenes here, there is some uh, intense graphic innuendo, uh, but there were not actual sex in the story. So that's not what it is. Um, his other series, however, have plenty of sex. Uh, if you want to go check his check him out on Amazon and you like uh, adult stories with RPG stuff, he has plenty of those as well. Okay, uh, on to the review for this particular novel, though. Um, a good third book in the Galactic Fist of Legion series, uh, the story returns to the zombie apocalypse world from the first book and finishes off that storyline. Uh, there's all the action, adventure, and humor, and sexual innuendo that you come to expect from this particular series. In addition, there are finally some answers about the larger reasons for the whole interdimension mission, mission thing, and you get to meet some of the entities behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, the parody is top notch, and I certainly appreciate the Dragon Ball Z references. Um, I also have to admit that I think Friendly Drunk Zombie is a great set species for the dead, uh, for the ended rather. So I. Really simple. I enjoyed the book. I really like this series in particular. Uh, this was a good third book, and it kind of tie thankfully tied up the the uh, undead realm storyline entirely. Like, there's no cutoffs. I mean, there's no like loose threads in any way, shape, or form. Um, so it's a nice place to kind of cap off this video series if you if the author wants to, or you can still. There's plenty of storylines because it's one of those um, stories where there's a, a a VR or a base with connections to other worlds uh so the author almost has unlimited opportunity to tell different stories by just sending his characters to these different worlds um so it may not be the end it may be either way i enjoyed it immensely uh galactic galactic fists of legend volume three gets a score of seven out of ten from me there we go simple okay uh next review depths of camelon a literal pd adventure camelon realm book two written by a.t gilbert it is a 245 pages, $3.10. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, um, real short author description. Asher is back in Camlin Realms, this time at the special request of Toterra Online's developers. He and a party of five of the players must go deep into the game to recover what is causing all the errors and glitches before time runs out. There you go. That's simple. Okay, um, the premise of the story is essentially after the contest of book one. Some beta players are hired to help isolate a rogue AI and some corrupt code in the VR game. They have 18 hours to find and defeat this corrupt code while it has barricaded itself in the dungeon. That's my kind of description of the novel. Um, basically, um, the, the premise of the story doesn't make sense to me. Um, and if you can get over it, you might have a good time with it. Um, 
but it's a little disappointing for me. Um, there's a tease in this particular setup of a rogue AI subplot, but it's not really fleshed out at all. What this instead turns into is kind of a straight dungeon dive um, with some whiny team dynamic issues uh, that get worked out during the story. And that's kind of all it is. Um, the dungeon itself gets a bit repetitive and that's mostly because the author doesn't take any breaks from the dungeon dive. Like he literally sets up, you have 18 hours to get this done. Dun, 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 dun. And the characters just go at it for entire, the entirety of the novel. It's just fight after fight, going to level after level, trying to get at the bottom. And, and, and individually, the fights aren't boring. There's a nice variety of monsters and everything. It's just that after a while of just continuous fight after fight, no breaks whatsoever. It's not like there's any breaks where they go back to town and restock or have these other adventures or anything and then come back to them. It's literally just fight after fight after fight after fight, dungeon knife, dungeon knife. Maybe they get the new gear, um, some arguments between each other, um, working out issues and whatever, Then, but continuously dungeon knifing. And it gets kind of old um, relatively quickly. Um, and for me, again, not a bad dungeon dive if that's what you're looking for. This is kind of, this is it. I mean, it's on, um, but for me, just kind of repetitive. And the the novel sort of promised a better story uh, with the AI development stuff, uh, with the, you know, rogue AI going wild, making errors in the code and controlling things. I actually thought it was going to be a, a more interesting trolling on that part, and it just didn't deliver. Uh, and so for me, it gets a score of six out of 10. Again, not bad or boring. It's just like, didn't make good for me. Uh, so it's Depths of Camelon, a little bit of adventure, Camelon Realm Book 2, with a score of six out of 10. Okay, on to our last review of the show, uh, Odyssey, The Stroke Tower, Book 2, written by Tony Corden. Okay, this one is a 391 pages. It is $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited either, but definitely this is a good read. I, I definitely purchased it. Uh, it. I will read you the author's description. Arthuria Lee Carroll grew up in a negative tax family in the gang-controlled suburbs of Brisbane at the end of the 21st century. From the age of six, she decided that she wanted more, and with the help of her local gang leader, she learned the skills to escape the relentless pressure to accept a life of mediocrity. On her 16th birthday, she was inadvertently implanted with a neural enhancement chip instead of the free government-provided basic-level personal AI. This mistake not only removed the limits placed on the AI, but also broke some of the government instigated control parameters. Leah's life rapidly becomes a battle, both in the virtual and multiverse world and, and in real life. On the advice of the local boss, Leia began playing in the virtual fantasy game Dunian to earn the money she needed to live at the local POD facility and help with their education. With the help of her rapidly evolving AI, she has not only thwarted attempts by the government to limit her opportunities, but evaded kidnapping by virtual slavers. Uh, co-opted by several virtual security AI, Leia has helped shut down a virtual sweatshop, which used mind-controlled players to farm for resources. The family, which runs the virtual crime syndicate, has cornered Leia in the depths of a virtual mine and sent 20 player mercenaries to capture her. Fleeing through a hidden doorway in a, into a mirror mine operated by goblins, Leia hopes to escape her pursuers. Literally, that's that's the summary of like book one. And also like the tech development side of it almost. Um, and it's not a bad summary. It's totally accurate. Um, um, honestly, I, again, I apologize, author. I'm reviewing this a little bit late. It came out, I believe, in October. Um, and I basically didn't recognize that it was new or that it had come out. So um, I missed the release date. But I'm glad somebody reminded me because this turned out to be, again, another favorite read of the week. Um, I reviewed book one in this series when it came out initially. I gave it a score of 6 out of 10. Um, 6 out of 10, rather. The novel in book one had a great setup. There's some great sci-fi stuff in there with AI implants, advanced virtual reality learning, um, game to real world money stuff. Um, and I thought it had a lot of potential as far as the series goes. Uh, it just wasn't realized in book one. Um, I'm happy to say that in book two, that potential is realized and more. Um, there are multiple interesting story threads in the novel that weave together a narrative that makes the game and real life stuff flow very well together and very interesting. Um, the early part of the novel focuses on the main character, again, Leah, getting access to rare dungeon series quests in the fantasy VR game. Um, she pulls in her friends, she made a book one, and they kind of do that for the first 40% of the novel. The first 40% of the novel, as far as the game storyline goes, is essentially a dungeon dive. And it's not the best 
dungeon dive story. It, it takes breaks. Unlike the last story I talked about, uh, this one does take breaks to, to, to jump in and out of the game part. So that kind of helps make it less tedious. But the, the combat and the, the combat's not the strong suit of this novel, I'll be honest. Um, but it does serve a very important part of the story in that it provides the main character with virtual amounts of uh, wealth, uh, the wealth that she needs uh, for other storylines later in the novel. And so it, it makes sense if you look at the story as like a unit. Um, but again, the, if you get bored with the, with the dungeon stuff, you really don't have to, I guess, I could, you could probably skip it if you really needed to. Uh, but honestly, the story is worth reading. Uh, later on, there's some more interesting game storylines that involve like a, a lost elven kingdoms, goblins, a ton of cool cultural stuff that turns into like world building for the fantasy game. And I really did like that a lot. Um, there's also an introduction of a space sci-fi space game uh, that has its own kind of plots and storylines that I also thought was kind of neat and cool. Um, so there's plenty of, of, of interesting things here. Even just if you break the strain, like real world storylines and game storylines, there's some cool game storylines there. It's just that it's not in the beginning part of the, of the dungeon dive section. Um, to me, though, however, the really good stuff is takes place outside of the game. Uh, the main character, again, made some seriously powerful enemies in book one, and now they're trying to ruin her life. Um, they're trying to stop her from accessing the VR pods. They're using their influence uh, to try to get her kicked out of college and even making real life threats to her life. Um, and how the main character deals with these threats is is really the most fascinating part of the story. And I really did love reading those things a lot. Um, be aware that I, if you're reading this story, um, the main character is becoming slightly overpowered, um, mostly because she has money as a superpower. But even in game, um, she's developing a lot faster than I think like the game mechanics should justify, personally. There are several places in the story where it's like where game logic is overridden for like story advancement. Like for example, in one place, um, the main character defeats who's at, I think one level one fifty or something. She kills a character who is at level 13,000, uh, and like 450 or something. Um, and that level difference doesn't make sense as far as like from, from a game logic standpoint, uh, but from a story pan standpoint, it sort of does, but it also is an important part of like moving the narrative forward. Um, and it's just a story choice that the author makes. Um, there's also a lot of like level jumping in the story. Like she goes from like, I think level 50 at the beginning to like a hundred and then 120, 150 and 170, 190, 237. Um, and those are some big jumps for some people. So, um, game logic wise, this one doesn't always present the most, um, logical standpoint, but again, the rest of the story kind of makes up for it. Like the game stuff is not what you're coming for, to be honest. The, um, the real life storyline is pro is like two to three times better than that. But there are some interesting storylines once you get out of that dungeon section. Um, it's just going to bother some people that she's a little OP. Um, the end is also, um, it just kind of stops. It's like a to be continued instead of like a real ending to a story. Um, and that is what it is. Um, overall though, a good book. I really did enjoy it. It would get like an eight out of 10, except for that first section of the story, which is a little boring because of the dungeon stuff. Um, but it was really quite enjoyable. I really did like this one a lot. Um, I look forward to reading book three next week uh, and giving a review. Uh, but for now, Odyssey, The Stroke Tower, book two, gets a score of seven out of ten. Uh, big old recommend for me. I enjoyed it. Uh, and that's it. We're done. They're finished. End of the show, folks. Thank you very much for for listening, for watching me and, and listening to me talk about RPG because I love it so much and I enjoy the, the, the genre and the community. It's a thing. Um, thanks for also letting me wear this funky hat all month long. It's getting a little itchy. I'm not sure if I should wash it because it has electronics. Um, I don't want to cause a fire. Um, but thanks for hanging out. Um, remember, you can follow the, the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, and Patreon, all the link in the show notes for you to, to go sign up for all the good stuff. And of course, the website where we have all our little bitty reviews, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of novels that we reviewed. Go check them out. Um, whenever you click on any of those little links that we have, you help support the podcast. Uh, we get a little bit of affiliate money from Amazon, like a couple pennies, uh, basically per dollar that you spend. But it, all those pennies add up to and help support the podcast. And it's a, it's a free way for you to support us. So thank you very much for that. Um, and of course, if you want to support the podcast in any way, shape, or form, you can find all the ways to do so at litrpgpodcast.com forward slash support. Um, again, thanks for hanging out with me. And until we can hang out again, folks, remember to go read some Lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>